James joining us now live from Kiev along with our Maria Villarreal from Poland where millions of refugees have fled to. James, let's start with you and Russia accusing Ukraine of these helo strikes on that fuel depot. What are Ukrainians telling you? Well, the Ukrainians uh, have not wanted to comment really at all on this. Uh, there have been three separate officials have come out to speak, and, and none of them have really given any real detail. They're kind of non-denial denials, uh, saying that uh, what happens in Russia isn't really up to them. They continue to defend themselves, uh, but they won't comment either way. What I will say, though, uh, Kira, in the last few moments, we have had a response from the Russians, who have now said officially, this is from Moscow, because until now all the commentary has come from Rostov on Don, which is the oblast, the, the region north of uh, north of the border, which is where Belgorod is, uh, the governor of that region has been making these accusations. But now Moscow has, has come into this, saying two Ukrainian helicopters entered the Russian Federation's airspace at an extremely low altitude at about five o'clock in the morning, Moscow time, on April 1st. It says the Ukrainian helicopters delivered a missile strike upon a civilian oil storage terminal located on the outskirts of Belgorod. They go on to say that a number of tanks were destroyed, um, but that no civilians were killed. Uh, he said, I like to stress that this facility is used to supply fuel only only to civilian transport vehicles. The oil terminal has no relation to the Russian armed forces. Now, that is quite significant. Uh, there have been two other alleged attacks on Russia. Uh, Ukraine has not confirmed either way whether or not they were behind them. Um, at, those, at that time, there wasn't any statement, we understand, from uh, Moscow. So for Moscow to have admitted, essentially, that its territory has been compromised in this way is significant. We still don't know whether or not it actually happened. Remember, Russia has been known in the past to kind of commit these false flag events as a pretext for uh, their own activities. Um, but, yeah, that, that's what the Russians are saying that, about that at this stage. Okay. Kira? All right. And, and James is also reporting, uh, Maria, about Mariupol. At least 100,000 people still trapped there in dire mm -hmm. conditions. Uh, Poland is bracing for another wave of refugees. The Red Cross is trying to get people out of there. We learned this this afternoon that they actually had trouble with that today. Is there anything more that you can tell us? Uh, so what we know is this is a convoy with the International Committee for the Red Cross. They are in, uh, they're in one city in Ukraine. They are trying to get to Mariupol. Uh, it's about 140 miles-ish between the two different cities. Uh, they, it, this is obviously a humanitarian um, a convoy that is going through. Three vehicles, nine staffers, and they cannot get to Mariupol. They had to turn around today and go back to their city to try and make sure that they were in safe in a safe situation. Um, obviously, they've made it known on social media. Media. They've made it known to security forces that are on the ground in Ukraine. They let them know that this is uh, this is the only way they can get people out of Mariupol. It is a dire situation in that city. As you said, close to 100,000 people still there as far as they know. Uh, these are people that, that do not have uh, food. They do not have electricity any longer. Um, they are living in a very rough situation, not to mention, obviously, the weather that we have going on in this region. Um, clearly, they are very concerned that more people could be injured or die if they're not careful and get them out quickly. And, Maria, you actually met with some refugees who already escaped from Mariupol. What's it been like for them and just watching what's happening to family, friends, you know, their, their home? I mean, the stories that we are hearing from these families that have escaped are absolutely horrific. Uh, to, to talk to one mother, um, she was with her two sons. She went out to walk the dog. When she got back, her house was gone. It had been bombed. And so to talk to her and other families, they explain how they had to walk a long distance, then they had to get on buses, then they were harassed by Russian military as they were trying to leave Ukraine. It took them days to get out of the country, and now they are in this refugee center, obviously safe, but still don't know what their future may hold. Their advice to a lot of the people there was to just start walking. They have to get out of Mariupol or else they may die if they continue to wait. So, James, peace talks, meanwhile, between Ukraine and Russia resume today. What's expected on that front? Well, Kira, again, we've just had another statement from the chief negotiator at those talks in, in the Ukrainian side uh, saying that the talks have been extremely difficult because they say the negotiation, negotiating parties are affected by what's happening here on the ground. And, you know, you saw yesterday the two airstrikes that hit here in Kyiv, the ongoing bombardment of civilian areas. You can tell that might impact what the Ukrainians think as they go into the negotiation. Um, but it's to their credit that they continue despite this. I think it's a realistic way of dealing with Russia. They haven't required a ceasefire in 
order to go to the negotiating table. Of course, that is part of the deal they are trying to strike. Principally, though, they are uh, talking about this key document called the Treaty on Security Guarantees, and it says, which provides for both the possibility of an exit from the current war and the subsequent prevention of such conflicts. And this is all about the issue of NATO. Russia wants Ukraine to leave NATO and become what it calls a neutral country. That would essentially mean a country which is entirely alone. Uh, Ukraine says, no, we will need to have alliances of some kind. And essentially what they're trying to do is replace the NATO alliance with other independent alliances with countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, France and others. Obviously, Russia would not be minded to allow that. So that is where the sticking point is. Uh, as far as we understand, the negotiations continue at some point. One would imagine they will get a deal. Everyone here in Ukraine, all the civilians who are suffering under the bombardment, hoping, of course, that deal comes sooner rather than later. James Longman, Maria Virial, thank you both very much. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.